I'm going to ask a big question. If it is true that with manual techniques, maybe we're not doing better than 25 to 50 percent of relevance in the discovery process, and that with the new technologies and the greater magnitudes and the greater difficulties of finding things because the language of human existence is not constrained the way the law is or the way music is. Is it fair to say justice is at stake? Sure, you're not being paranoid. Any thought? I sense a slight coming yeah. up. Now we have a card-carrying fanatic on this. So I'm not against utopia. I've just never seen it. I should just take your word for it. You're wearing very much me different. out. You're wearing me out, Judge. I, I sense nothing more that you're worried about. Let's stop this dirty talk with numbers. I'm so cynical. I believe that the words "honest broker" are contradiction in terms. Yeah. Oh, very clever, Patrick. Okay. <laughs> What I take away from all this is disobey French law, but drink their wine. Look at that. Transforming the American legal system. Justice for all. This is big talk. Just a word to you folks as to what we're going to do. I'll tell you exactly what I said to the panel. We got together about 15 or 20 minutes ago, and I said we're going to have a bull session. Now, that means everything that we do is unrehearsed, it is spontaneous, it's improvised, it's a bowl session. Let's start by having the panel introduce himself or herself. I'm Hugo Teufel. I'm the Chief Privacy Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. I'm Ron Brockman. I'm the Vice President of Worldwide Research Operations at Yahoo. And Jason Barron, Director of Litigation at the National Archives and Records Administration. I'm Nicholas Economo, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, H5. Stephen Brara, Justice of the Supreme Court. Richard Brayman, Founder and Executive Director of the Sedona Conference. I'm Julie Brickle, Associate General Counsel at Altria Corporate Services. I'm Patrick Ute, Director of Electronic Discovery and Litigation Counsel at Verizon. I'm Ann Kershaw. I'm the founder of A. Kershaw PC, Attorneys and Consultants. I'm David Vladek. I teach civil procedure and other litigation-related courses here at Georgetown Law School. I'm Mark Rotenberg. I teach privacy law here at Georgetown. I'm also director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. I'm John Facciolo. I'm a United States Magistrate Judge in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. It's a rather impressive panel. Very impressive, very impressive. But these individuals are only a few of those who are actually participating in this summit. You're all participating in the summit and at various times we'll come and we'll talk to you because the wealth of experience and knowledge in the audience is very important in terms of contributing to this discussion. Now, I'm happy to be here I'm happy to be in this lovely, if crowded, environment. Uh, but maybe I'm the man from Mars. Maybe I came here from a planet far, far away a long time ago to meld into this society. But I've got to tell you, folks, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Part of my job while here is being a lawyer, and I've been a lawyer, and, you know, okay. You have to deal with a lot of information. 
you've always had to deal with a lot of information. Plaintiff wants a bunch of things. Defendant resists. Lots of motions. Sooner or later, stuff is turned over. Life goes on. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? I mean, look at that. Transforming the American legal system. Justice for all. This is big talk. So I just don't get it. Now, I'm told that to get it, I have to start by thinking about magnitude. Now, Jason, sadly, I've been obliged to read some of your writings. <laughs> and you're big on this subject. And according to you, not only do I have to think about magnitude, but I've got to go back to the discovery of fire or something. <laughs> Now, you want to take us very quickly from Genesis to today? Sure. Uh, the electronic information explosion is apparent to, I think, virtually everyone in this room and to many lawyers. Uh, it's fundamentally different. We understand that there could have been big cases before in the 20th century. But with the advent particularly of email and particularly of the Internet, I think life has changed. And there's been an explosion, at least for the government's sake, uh, the big bang in terms of information explosion was the Armstrong case, the White House email case where there was a challenge made to how government keeps its records and whether email was itself a record. And starting with just um, that one case, the White House changed its policies. It blinked. It started to keep email, and it kept tremendous volumes of it. And so by the time at the end of the Clinton administration, there are 32 million email records that the White House has preserved. And projecting out into the future, whatever the next administration beyond the incumbent is, there'll be a billion emails, a billion records in a particular litigation is far greater than anybody has experienced in paper. Plus, with one more point, not just with email, but the, the fact is, is that electronic records are ephemeral, they're different, they're complex, they're technical issues, they're legacy issues. It is You're very much me different. Out. You're okay. wearing me out. Ron, help me wrap myself around the numbers. Give me. You know, people, will, people talk about gigabytes and terabytes and gigabytes. petabytes. Yeah, terabytes. gigabytes. You've heard of gigabytes. You probably have 60 of them on your iPod. But it's really hard to wrap your head around sort of the scale of some of the things we're talking about. So there's a report that came out of Berkeley a few years ago about the amount of new information that was created by humanity in the year 2002. Okay? The number quoted, again, big grain of salt, was five exabytes. Now, many of you have probably never even heard the term exabytes. We start with kilobytes, and then there's megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, and then there's exabytes. And by the way, I heard that it's called that because they couldn't even think up a word for, for numbers that big. But if, in fact, humanity generated that much information in 2002, God knows what it was last year, but those numbers are so unbelievably staggering you can't figure them out. So, for example, an exabyte is something with a 1 and 18 zeros. Um, if you were to take the equivalent of, say, a paper document um, in an online file and print it out, by some measures, you take about 800 megabytes, which, again, should be small for you guys on your machines these days. Um, that would, if printed out, give you about 30 linear feet of books, okay, 800 megabytes. So if you multiply that out to this 10 to the 18th factor, the way I figured, and I might math maybe off a little bit, you get, roughly speaking, 35 million miles of paper. That's more than a third of the way to the sun. Um, that's just in 2002. Now, of course, presumably no one case is going to have to deal with that kind of information, but it's indicative of how scary and how bad the situation already is. And does this have anything to do with the reality of normal-sized businesses or litigants? <laughs> you tell a man. I should, I should just take your word for it. Um, it's not uncommon to see cases today with 80 gigabytes. Um, you have, Arthur, a thousand employees can generate a terabyte of data in one year. And a terabyte of data can fill up 8.8 .8 Empire State Buildings. 
And when you have five years of data from 1,000 employees in any organization, you have 44 Empire State Buildings. And it's not uncommon in any litigation for an adversary to say, we want you to preserve all of the email and data for 1,000 employees. And it's, it's a lot of stuff. Now, Julia, you come from a, a mega company. Patrick comes from a mega company. Do these magnitude figures make sense to you in the litigation context? You're both involved in litigation. For our purposes, uh, just to give you an idea of a recent government filing that we had, uh, we had about 1.2 terabytes of data. Now, to give you an idea of the volume of paper there, that can take you back and forth to the moon on a paper ladder um, that you could climb up and, and down again. So uh, it's, it's a tremendous amount of volume. And in that case, attorneys had to look at every single document. So um, it, it just to, to give you an idea, the magnitude of costs in that, just the, uh, the review of those documents alone cost us $4 million. Now, Jason. <laughs> That it's different in, in nature. What does that mean? I think it's different, Arthur, because it's uh, essentially invisible. It can be carried around on uh, small devices that look like this, and this can be 5, 10, 15 boxes, perhaps, of documents that you're carrying around. So employees uh, can move it from place to place with great ease, and it's easily duplicated so that the volumes, uh, whatever it is that's generated, and, you know, there are estimates that while we're sitting here, maybe 10 billion spam email will be sent out around the world. Uh, the, the ability then and the propensity of IT departments uh, and employees of other sorts to duplicate the information makes the problem even bigger. Now, Judge, does this show up in <laughs> any way in the litigation context? Every day. Every day? Yeah. Well, you, you always have, first of all, as Richard just pointed out, this would be a heck of a lot easier for everybody if somebody took 10 minutes and organized it. But the hard drives in our system have become garbage cans. This guy throws it out, this guy doesn't. So you immediately confront the fact that the records aren't organized. It's not like a file cabinet where you open the drawer and look A, B, C, D, E, F. It's an entirely different thing. So every company becomes the prisoner of the supposed record system they have. The vast majority of them don't have record keeping systems. The consequence for the courts is enormous. The problem this is drawing is that Rich people can do this. Poor people can't. And that's the way this may go, that litigation in the federal courts may become a place for the rich place people to play. Now, Arthur, there's another way in which it's really a mess. Um, in the old days, even if there were thousands of miles of paper, it would typically be paper and things written in natural languages. But we've got instant messaging, email. So in fact, it's not just pure volume, it's complexity and variability in the types of media. And that's not even mentioning video, audio, images, cell phone pictures, you name it. We negotiate now, that out of the discovery plan. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. <Thank goodness. laughs> right, Ariana? <laughs> This is a romanticized view about the way things work and worked in the past. I mean, for those of us who actually cut our teeth back when there was paper and where the copying machine was the new technology, this is coming out of a cave. Uh, the first case I worked on was a class action case involving 10,000 class claimants. Can you imagine the paper involved in that case? Every piece of paper had to be sifted and collated by hand, there were no searchable databases. There were no optical scanners. The only optical scanner was me. And, <laughs> uh, and frankly, I didn't do a very good job. Yeah, so the point. In the old days, you could actually ask for everything and still manage it and deal with well, it. You can't do that anymore. There were cases in which you know, the, the response to the plaintiff was, bring your forklift. I've got to ask the justice, who I've known for years since we were colleagues together, and I know his face. And I sense that he's bemused <laughs> by all this. After all, in your court, no one can write more than 50 pages on pain of death. Yeah, so I've, never <laughs> written, I've never written more than about 25 or 30 max. But mm -hmm. as, I, as I listen to this, I've been, I, I mean, I, it, I'm in what you call uh, blissful ignorance. I mean, I'm, I'm starting from ground zero. I, I'm a sort of babe in the woods. So I've been fascinated 
Why? Because the first thing I hear, I think, well, what's the problem? You know, I write a lot of words, too, that are saved. I have like 19 drafts of an opinion. And anybody who eventually wants to read draft 1 through 9, 18 is welcome to it. It's a lot of rubbish, basically. I change a comma, it's a new draft. I mean, so then I thought, well, this, what's the problem? And then I suddenly heard, uh-oh, no lawyer is going to turn over uh, documents without reading them. And suddenly I think, oh, my goodness, $4 million? And it needn't be a defendant. I guess it could be a plaintiff in a lot of cases, too. So how do you do it? Now suddenly I'm really puzzled because uh, you can't just have cases costing $4 million. before. But how can the lawyer turn over everything? If he turns over everything, there's nothing uh, left to privacy in the company, and they can't run their company because people won't tell the truth, at least on an email. So it really sounds like a dilemma. So I put it back to you. Arthur, because wait, wait, it sounds, I, no, this I is what, no, well, <laughs> all right, but uh, my reaction as yeah. I hear this is it seems to me you're, you're sketching a kind of dilemma. Uh, uh, on one horn of the dilemma is the only way is to tailor the discovery and say there are whole classes of things we're not going to get unless we can show really good cause and like emails, old emails, but maybe the one's relevant. Well, maybe you won't be able to get it. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. Because, after all, that might be the smoking gun. Oh, my goodness. On the other hand, the only way to get it is going to cost everybody $8 million a case. They won't get it either because we reserve the court for rich people. We will actually <laughs> try to deal with the justice's apprehension. Let's start. I'm going to go back to Jason because he's the most euphoric member of the panel. <laughs> I feel euphoric. I, what have I heard so far? I've heard magnitude. I've heard lack of organization. How do you find something? Has that changed? Well, that's the problem. Every lawyer in this room has drafted an interrogatory and a request to produce saying, I want all documents on X. Well, all is very, very difficult when you have 32 million or a billion of something, and they're in all types of forms, and they're in in a legacy data that can't be read easily. So the, 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 there are tremendous uh, search and retrieval issues for the profession to deal with to try to get asymptotically as close to all as possible, even though that's an aspirational goal. Isn't it the responsibility of the organization to manage their information? And doesn't that bring them its own benefit to, to them, not just because of litigation, but we're in an information world right now. That is the key asset of any organization. And if they manage their information better, e-discovery wouldn't be such a bugaboo, and they would be building the assets of their organization. Yeah. So let me ask Nicholas. So I uh, well, wait, wait, I haven't asked you anything yet. <laughs> wait a sec. Okay. I mean, we hear from Jason that the Lexis Westlaw doesn't work. But he sort of acknowledges that one of the reasons it doesn't work is because we're lazy and we don't frame properly. Isn't it, isn't it possible with improved search techniques on traditional technology, we can find what we have to find. So actually, I think I'd like to make a slightly contrarian uh, point in saying that we should look at the similarities between the old world and the new world. And in a way, we have a problem of a greater magnitude. And Nicholas is Greek. Yes. <laughs> so hence the fast, so the fast pace. But so um, we have much more expensive filing cabinets, and yes, much more information. But the key similarity between the old world and the new world, the warehouse and today's databases, is that we were not very good at finding the right information back then, although maybe we pretended that we were, or mostly we believe today it is assumed that the good old days we knew how to find everything. And we're actually not good at all at it today. We're not much better or much worse today with all of the technologies that are available to the attorneys, the researchers, than we were a few years ago with pure warehouses. And there is actually a wealth of academic evidence that shows that from a study, a landmark study in the mid-80s that showed that attorneys given all the time to find the relevant information uh, in a collection actually only found about 25% of that information. It's the a, it's a Blair and Marin study. And there is ample, and actually the uh, TREC, a famous organization that deals with information trivial issues, has made studies that shows that there is this performance ceiling that tells you no matter what you use, full manual review, search tools with manual review, uh, you know, AI, whatever that means to anyone, you still hit the performance ceiling that you will miss no matter what you do, 35, 50, 60, 70 percent of what you should be finding. And most of these studies were conducted on collections that were no more than a couple of hundred thousand pages. Imagine on 5 million, 10 million, 100 million. 
The second point I want to quickly make is the following. Everybody's experience generally with the masses of data is through the internet and the uses of Yahoo or Google. And every one of us is pretty happy with what we find. And therefore, the inherent assumption there is that, well, if what works for me on the web will work for me in the context of litigation or retention, there is an assumption that through these technologies you can actually manage the information. And I'd like to deny that premise. No, you cannot. And here is why. Finding some relevant information, as we all do on the web, five, ten relevant documents, is a task that Yahoo, Google performs superbly. But it's a task that is fundamentally antithetical with a task you're trying to conduct litigation or retention or regulatory compliance where you're trying to find all of the relevant information. If I hear Nicholas and a couple of the other people, what they're sort of telling us is that there's a little irony here. We have these incredibly increased capacities to record, to move away from an oral environment with all of the frailties of recollection and orality. Yet, we haven't really improved our ability to find the relevant things. Going back to the justice, it, it, you know, if we've always been that bad at it, and we're not really much worse at it, who gives a fig? <laughs> huh? Well, that's life goes on. Certainly, from a matter of efficiency, I, I would think. Now, I'm I'm in government, but in prior lives, so I've been in private practice, and and I think back to one case involving a uh, an aerospace contractor in the Midwest. I was with Government Contracts Council, a partner at my firm, and me, and I was an associate at the time, and I thought, we're all reviewing documents, and of the three of us, I could do a better job faster than the other two, being not as senior as they are, and being much more uh, able to do that sort of thing. So, so we may not be any better at finding things, but if technology will allow us to do that work faster and cheaper, then that, that certainly is an advantage. Now, Th there are going to be privacy aspects to that, and I'm sure Mark Rotenberg will have some comments about that, but we'll get into oh, that I'm later. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure. I'm going to ask a big question. If it is true that with manual techniques, maybe we're not doing better than 25 to 50 percent of relevance in the discovery process, and that with the new technologies and the greater magnitudes and the greater difficulties of finding things because the language of human existence is not constrained the way the law is or the way music is. Is it fair to say justice is at stake? I, don't have, I do have confidence that David can find the material he wants to find, or at least a lot of it. I, I, from listening, I don't see that as an enormous problem any more than it's ever been. But what I did hear that was new, if we think of civil cases and not criminal cases for the moment, is the enormous cost of complying with an order that says, look through everything that you have in order to find the information that either the plaintiff or the defendant might want. And that's the universe of things you're going to look for, through, not the universe of things you're going to find. Now, if it really costs millions of dollars to do that, then you're going to drive out of the litigation system a lot of people who ought to be there. And the companies, when they sue each other, will not, they're free. They'll go to arbitration. They'll go somewhere where they write their own discovery rules. And I think that's unfortunate in many ways. But they're free to walk, vote with their feet. And then the plaintiff, who's not represented by you, for example, or others, uh, this might have a hard time getting into court. All right, what could be done about that? And there I think back to what you taught me or your colleagues, that what we have to have is a simple notice pleading rule that allows then after a simple notice to get everybody into discovery. And then we go to discovery and we look through everything to find what we need. Now that's what you taught. And that's what Ben Kaplan taught and the others and Al Sachs. And so I think of asking you, well, are you feeling like Martin Luther supposedly thought now on his deathbed where he said, well, maybe it wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> but but, 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 but uh, uh, the point is, the only way that I can see out of that is to start having discovery orders that don't limit things by subject matter. But in addition to subject matter, start limiting the universe of things that are going to be looked through. Now, that's seems to me, I don't know if that's done. And I don't know why it couldn't be done 
Or I begin to think of limitations on discovery in terms of, and this is a real shocker, in terms of costs. I know that judges today sometimes say to the lawyers, you have two hours, okay? They get them to agree. Use them as you wish. Well, maybe you have $200,000 or maybe you have to meet thresholds. But unless you're going to limit either in terms of costs or in terms of uh, where you look, then if the costs are enormous, justice is at stake. Because then who gets to come into court and what they get to do is driven by their wealth and not by the merits of the case. And I think that's terrible. Okay. Everybody has experienced the big case phenomenon, or I shouldn't say everybody. I suspect many people in the audience and the participants on the panel. And when you say big case, big case, words come to you. What words come to your mind? I want epithets. Boring is an epithet. Late nights. Ariana, what words come to your mind? Complex. Complex. Boring. Late nights. Motions. Motions? Not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of negotiating with my adversary. Many of the people here know that, that mm. I believe, given how this area of technology has evolved, that in order for litigation to reach a successful and just conclusion, that you actually have to come out of the box thinking ahead because when we talk about justice, I, I was jo jotting down just a couple of ideas, things. Um, rich versus poor. That's one issue that came up. Judge Facciola mentioned it. Some other panelists did, too. Knowledge versus ignorance. There are some people on one side of the V that are far more advanced in their understanding of this area than perhaps on the other side of the V. In addition, there's access to information versus lack of access to information. The fact that a producing party, yes, has to go through the exercise of compiling and culling and mining that information, yes, very expensive, yes, very complicated, yes, very tedious at times. Um, let, let's go back to people like, like Richard and, and, uh, and uh, Anne and Jason. Uh, we're beginning to hear words like negotiation. I've heard the word collaboration. Uh, is there, Jason, start us off. Is there a way out of this box? Well, I think the... Uh the new federal rules talk about, uh, uh, they make this, uh, what one would think is minimalist changes, ESI, uh, into, into uh, Rule 26 and Rule 34. But in fact, what the, what the changes are are kind of profound because uh, what Ariana is just saying and what others are saying is absolutely right. We, we are going to all have struggling to deal with these volumes of information, the complexity of the technical issues, especially those of us who are English majors in college who, who struggle with this every day and have to have a steep learning curve. Um, we're going to need to have a collaborative uh, relationship with our adversaries within the adversarial paradigm more than we ever had. It's already, it's always been um, somehow implicit in the federal rules since the 1930s that there'd be cooperation within certain rules, but it's never been as explicit as the 2006 amendments make it. And what I've argued is that um, we're going to be thinking about iterative ways of meet and confers, multiple times where individuals on op opposing sides are going to have to come and talk to each other, sampling. Uh, against these large databases. Um, they're, they're creative ways to collaborate on search terms, on search protocols, on new and exotic forms of searches like concept searches and other things beyond keywords where the conversation, if it can be had, will advance mm -hmm. rule one of the federal rules. It will lead to a just and speedy and more economical way of proceeding in litigation. But that is, that is something that is very difficult for people of a certain age. Ah! To, uh, to deal with. I sense it, a slight coming yeah. on. <laughs> All of us. I, I say one thing. When I go around in the federal government, I say there's one criterion for each general counsel's office and each solicitor's office to appoint somebody as knowledge counsel who really gets it on a visceral level about the technology and the complexity. And there's only one criterion for that person. That person should have no conscious awareness of Neil Armstrong having landed on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> And if you, are, if you are under 40, you get it. If you're of a certain age like myself, it's a struggle. 
Right. We, we oldsters, we deal with equity and justice, complete outmoded, archaic <laughs> concepts, right? <laughs> and you live this. You live this. This is what you're all about. Right. And I want to add to what Jason said, that that meet and confer that we're talking about in this collaborative process, it's only going to work if you walk into it with knowledge. I mean, we're talking about data here. And you're talking about usually your client's data. And it is a wealth of information. And your client has lots of things to tell you. And if you get on it soon and early when you know you have to deal with this, and you can walk into a meet and confer, and this is the hard part, be transparent about how you figured out that, oh, it's not the 300 custodians that the adversary wants. It's really just these 20 people. And how do you know that? Because you went and you talked to people. You looked at the data. You read the data. And when they think, oh, it's these 50 keywords, and by the way, most of those studies that people talk about, they were unsuccessful because people had the wrong key words. Because it's people just supposing what they think the right word is going to fetch the right data. Well, guess what? You can look at the data. You can talk to the people. You can find out what was the language that they used, and you can work with your adversary to come up with meaningful search, strat search strategies. I mean, there's lots of different technologies that help you get into the data and find what you want. How right? do you convince either the client or typically, I suppose, outside counsel? I mean, let's face it. Even you show them. from great law schools like Georgetown, even with great procedure teachers like David. <laughs> the signals in a first year procedure course often are hide the ball. Hide the ball. You want to say, okay, new game, new game, turn over the ball. Yes, I don't care whether my client swings or not. Turn over the ball. <laughs> Throw in the towel. Squeal. Rat out. Isn't that what's, what's really happening? That in a lot of, uh, with a lot of lawyers, the discovery game has now reached new heights because the potential to get a discovery got you, which leads to a result, a la the Morgan Stanley case, for example, that is not based on the merits, but is based on a discovery problem. Uh, it re essentially removes predictability from the legal system, uh, I think doing a disservice to the, the entire system. And that's where I think the game is. There's a lot of talk and a lot of conferences where um, I've heard parties get up and they talk about if you can go after the discovery problems and if you go after e-discovery where the problems, since it's invisible and portable and dupli duplicable, um, it's v very easy to find problems. It's hard to get everything. You won't get everything when you do e-discovery. Uh, that's where the gotchas are, and that's an easy way to push a settlement in a case. And that's why the culture change that you mentioned is so necessary, and it's got to begin in law school so that those hints you mentioned... In law school? So that those hints you mentioned... That Sooner or later, everybody blames law school. About hiding the ball. It, it's a given. You don't want a hide-the-ball mentality to come out. The procedures that the new rules put in place, the Sedona principles mentioned them in 2003, Early meet and confers with the opposing side about what you have, how you're going to get what you need on We've the table. We've had Rule 26 what you F need to start there with. for years. In law school, students need to be told that there's a time for adversarialness. That's the courtroom. And there's a time when you need to cooperate and collaborate with your adversary to get the facts on the table about what you're going to litigate about. And unless that message gets to the law students, the young lawyers that come out of law school are going to be asking for everything, trying to hide the ball in response to those requests, leading to the, the incre incredible magnitude of costs that we're talking about. If people start collaborating, and they're going to only learn that in law school, then you're going to find that they'll get the facts on the table in a reasonable, cost-effective way and save the adversarialness of the process for the courtroom where it belongs. David, do you have any uh, concern about this? Well, we, we try to teach our students not to play gotcha in discovery, and I think we do a good job for two reasons. The first is, if you look at the incentives in litigation, the plaintiff has no incentive to be inundated with an avalanche of irrelevant documents. That costs the plaintiff more money than, than is being saved. The defendant, who may or may not try to, try to play gotcha, uh, has terrible risks if they get caught. Now, doesn't deter all of the old school lawyers that didn't get this message. Uh, but I think the new generation of lawyers understands the incentives. And I, the second point is I think the rule changes that you helped orchestrate, by the way, 
shift very much the way litigation is conducted. When we started out, the parties drove litigation. The judge was occasionally called into referee disputes, but essentially, you, if, if discovery went well, you never saw the judge. That's not true any longer. Discovery starts with your Rule 16 conference. You don't take discovery until the judge or magistrate judge like John gives you the green light and the judge plays an integral role in the supervision of discovery and even more so with, with e-discovery. There's going to be disputes about whether databases are readily accessible. This gets to Justice Breyer's concern about money. Those disputes are going to be dissolved quickly and at the threshold by the district court judge. Disputes about what gets surged, how voluminous, those are going to end up on the desk of the district court judge. So there's, there's a very different ethic that now runs through the discovery process in the federal courts. If you so, want discovery, you got to go through the judge. Patrick, you're part of this vaunted younger generation. And Georgetown alum. <laughs> <laughs> and you represent a Fortune 20 company. Who's going to drive this sea change? This is a sea change in thinking about litigation. I don't see it yet. Um, I, th I think the concept of the smoking gun being in the documents might just be over. The, the concept right now that I'm seeing constantly in cases that are coming across uh, is the smoking gun is the, uh, the, the gotcha, the electronic discovery gotcha. Um, the, we've been receiving more and more 30B6 deposition notices uh, from plaintiff's attorneys thinking you know, that they have the very next Morgan Stanley case, the very next Zabulek case. So I think the culture is not changing. I, I would highly disagree with that. Uh, would so. you like it to change? Oh, I mean, okay. from your perspective, your professional perspective. Uh, definitely, definitely would make everything a lot easier. Uh, you know, I think that as a corporation where uh, you know we don't, uh, we have sort of this concept that we don't have that many bad documents out there. So uh, responsiveness isn't so much of an issue for us; it's more of a privilege issue. What's wrong with the thirty b six deposition to find out who you need to ask more questions of? It, it just adds more cost. It, you know, it just wait, wait, wait. Well, let's stop this dirty talk with numbers. <laughs> let's get away from nuts and bolts and all that. Do you believe that collaboration may become possible? Do you believe in this utopian perception that we'll all lock arms and <laughs> sing songs around the fire? And <laughs> Call me when the shuttle lands. <laughs> Call you when the yeah. shuttle lands. Now, Nicholas, you know, you're not a lawyer. You have any ideas about this? Okay, so a couple, actually. Um, the first one is that if you think about the current process for identifying documents, a lot of the areas of expertise that should be part of it are actually missing. It's a very complex process, as you pointed out earlier. There are no process engineers, no really appropriately trained project managers, and so on and so forth, no experts in linguistics involved to define those search terms. So it's really a lot of attorneys practicing without a license, as it might be. Uh, so the other element is that the adversarial piece of this process is fundamentally due to the fact that if there is a truly acrimonious fight and I have to rely on the employees or people paid by the, the other side to go and find documents, will these employees truly do the work objectively when maybe they have 30 years in this company and their retirement depends on it? You cannot really remove that fundamentally and you can talk about uh, how you're going to collaborate better and so given that I was asked to offer a utopian view, I would offer this view. The view that I would offer is that if you want to truly change the dynamics of this adversarial process, you would need to find a mechanism under which an honest broker would take up the role of actually determining with both sides, perhaps with obligations towards the court as well, to, to identify what truly should be looked for, how one defines what should be looked for, and then have a mandate to go and identify the full body of documents that is relevant to the case. And beyond that, to offer the court and both parties measurable metrics through which you could demonstrate that you have in fact found all or nearly all the relevant documents within the limit of current scientific knowledge. Today, whether you're in an adversarial process, whether you're trying to be a, acting in good faith as a corporation to serve your uh, obligations, even if you're in the best of faith, you simply can't effectively meet your obligations Generally, for the reasons I explained earlier, there's truly no way to do that. 
But worse than that, you even don't know, you don't know where you are because you don't know how to measure. Have you found 20%? Have you found 50%? I would venture to say that if I asked in this organization, who knows? People have huge responsibilities in, in charge of critical legal tasks. How do you know of everything that you should have retained, everything you should have produced, everything you should have found? How much have you actually retained, produced, or found? Does anyone know how to measure that? But those same questions existed 40 years ago. They did, except that now you have filing cabinets that cost 20 and 30 million dollars and productions that cost as much. And 20, 30 years ago, we did just as badly and even then, this challenge wasn't recognized. The need for measurement is as important as it was back then. And if you have an honest broker who brings together all of these competencies, including those measurement competencies, which are statistics, really. This is not some future technology. It's statistics. Measure how well you've done. Know how to measure it accurately. I then both be, parties could rely on that third. On I that must be broker. absolutely and irretrievably. Let me, add one, one comment. let me ask one comment, Arthur, right. which is the following. We heard earlier about HSR, and it is a utopian view, this view of the honest broker. But I do believe that if there is, if there is one area where it might be tested, it, or it could be considered, is a friendly merger where both parties are willing to work collaboratively with DOJ to jointly determine truly what should be identified and produced. David pointed to the judge, right? Now, other than the judge, I'm so cynical, I believe that the words honest broker are contradiction in terms. Yeah. <laughs> what about the judge, Arthur? I, I'm pointed at him. I mean, he got the wrong word. He means a neutral. He means I a understand neutral. that. I understand. <laughs> are you... Do you have the time for this? I certainly do, and I've got to make the time, because there's no other alternative. I mean, I have had cases which I suggested the keywords. Uh, I have, uh, I supervised uh, on a daily basis the search that was done in a particular case and drove the parties to narrow the keyword searching and all of those things. So we magistrate judges, it, it's estimated we spend 70, 80 percent of our time negotiating and uh, in mediation. Mm -hmm. This is just another variation on the theme. So I welcome that. You I welcome, welcome the that. opportunity, that, that, of course. That, that, to me, that's a very important you, word, you, that welcome. We can't have a justice system where searching for something costs $4 million. Mm. It doesn't have to cost that, that, that. That's right. impossible. Right. It that's doesn't have to be true. that way. If you well, do it the okay, right way, it doesn't have to be that well, way. Well, okay, but remember, I also see fee petitions, you know? Mm. Yeah. And we're trying to get a pay raise, and boy, I wish somebody looked at those fee petitions. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you see the possibility of of their developing a, a cadre of people. Well, let's, let's pick up uh, yes, Nicholas's concept, the honest broker, the yeah. neutral, the intermediary, so that your time or your colleagues who may not be as receptive as you could pick up that slack. I think we could, yes. Yeah. Now, here I want to come back to Patrick. How long are you out of law school? Uh, 2001. 2001. And what, what is your job? Uh, director of the, my actual title, or what do I do? <laughs> your title. Let's start with your title. All right, it's uh, director of electronic discovery and senior counsel for Verizon. For Verizon. For Verizon. That's pretty responsible stuff for a kid. <laughs> huh? 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 He doesn't mom. know you very well. <laughs> Now, when you were at law school, did they teach you how to be uh, this master of electronic <laughs> stuff? No. So what's, what would be your message to uh, the class of 08, 09, 010, the students, about <laughs> opportunities? That's my soapbox, actually. I try soapbox. to. Soapbox. My soapbox. I try to tell students more than anything, uh, understand this process. It is the most important process right now, unfortunately, um, in litigation, in commercial litigation. It's, uh, you know, as I was saying before, the gotcha is not about the case anymore. It's about the discovery issues. So that being said, uh, I, I think that's, that's my takeaway. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any courses in this in law school? Uh, he, do you see how David's head <laughs> shot off? <laughs> uh, actually, there's a, a federal magistrate judge that teaches one here at Georgetown. Uh, the, there are also CLE programs that do allow students to attend. The Georgetown CLE program here yeah. is free for students. Mm -hmm. um, the Sedona Conference is another educational forum where they can uh, pick up additional knowledge about the subject matter. But Arthur, if even if you get that education, when you start your new job at the law firm and the partner says, 
no, I want to do it that way. I want a manual review. I mean, you're not going to say no. I mean, it's hard to buck the establishment. Um, it's yeah. true, but but the, uh, as Patrick is living testament to, <laughs> there are other career paths. I had a very smart boss. A very <laughs> smart. Let's go to let's go to the group. Look, l listen or think about what they've just been talking about. They they've been talking about transforming the litigation model, at least in part, from an adversarial to a collaborative model. Uh, they've talked a bit about uh, relationships between the client, in the case of our panel, corporations, and the outside counsel, the litigating counsel. We've talked just a touch about uh, maybe a shortfall in formal legal education today. Instead of another jurisprudence course, maybe we should have a course that provides the kinds of skills that uh, Patrick has, has developed. Now, what do you think? Okay, Mark Reichenbach, you here? Hi, you submitted a question. What's on uh, your grievance list? And Anne kind of alluded to before that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be that way, and he talked about errors and, and how it can lead you astray, but, you know, given that there are deficiencies in keyword searching and, and you know, how, how does the law or how does the judiciary uh, contemplate or are they contemplating now addressing this, this deficiency of keyword searching and incorporating uh, this new technology or, or, or updated ways of being able to kind of minimize um, this. The gentleman talked about how the plaintiff had um, an advantage here and I can say if my time on the plaintiff's side the amount of data was 50 CDs or 100 CDs was just as much a problem uh, on my desk on the defense side as it was when I was on the plaintiff side. So either way, I, I just um, I want to know if, if the judiciary, if what ways you're contemplating um, addressing these new forms of technology. Well, well you heard uh, a very diligent magistrate judge say he's, he's a player. He's uh, in the game. But, but that was with key words. And I think that there is, there is an inherent um, there is problem with keyword searching itself. There's deficiencies there. Um, keywords, if you don't use the right ones, they're under-inclusive. If you are overly broad and use too many, then you're going to get too many false positives. It creates a much bigger population that has to be reviewed. Richard, Sedona, what's it going to do about this? We, uh, our biggest advocacy is dialogue and that you learn a lot from engaging in dialogue. That's not an adversarial process. And if people would have, like in their meet and confers now over e-discovery issues, have real dialogue with the other side, put stuff out on the table, you bring the knowledge to that meet and confer so that you can meaningfully find out what you need to do. Then you can come up with some reasoned approach to discovery that has some limits on it. When I remember when the limit on depositions first came into the federal rules. The older litigators thought, oh my God, how can I possibly litigate a case if I've only got 15 depositions? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they found ways to do that. Can I make a, a comment in response to Mark Rackenbach? Yeah. Uh, Mark may ask really what can be, what can be done. And, it, and so I think there is an interesting shift in and actually the upcoming information approval commentary uh, of the Sedona Conference um, where there is a shift in focus from looking at technologies and deba having theological debate about what works and concept search and all these things which truly sort of meaningless from a scientific perspective, they don't mean much. What truly matters is an emphasis on transparency of the process that you use, and, I, and I, would, I would say on measurability. How do you measure? Does it really matter if you prefer concept search or keywords or full manual review, if it works and if you can show that it works? And, and the shift in the upcoming commentary, I think, focusing people on principles, how is it that you should be designing those review processes? What does it mean to have an effective use of information retrieval technologies, as opposed to saying, oh, this is more sophisticated or more complex. And so that's a welcome shift. Um, and so I, ju I just want to actually understand. You made a very <laughs> sophisticated point, though, uh, Nicholas. And, and the fact is that through uh, Richard's leadership at Sedona Conference, we're going to be putting out a search and retrieval commentary as an educational piece for the profession. Because I, I think this is a pretty sophisticated crowd. I think uh, this crowd gets it in terms of uh, possible deficiencies in in the sort of the status quo of how lawyers approach uh, search issues and 
dealing with the volume of information, but most lawyers don't. And so it's, it's a need to get a, a sort of an educational message out there and a comfort level with a certain level of technical terminology, which um, we're all going to have to deal with in the future. So with all the caveats that Nicholas is saying that, that the, the science is, um, it, it, there are limitations to it. I think there are, there are ways that the research shows that there, there are better ways to approach these problems um, in using a multitude of different ways to search for information and for uh, solving some of the cost issues. And so we, we just need to get a little smarter. And the Sedona piece that's coming out later this year is a step. This conference is a step. And it's just, and, and we should be, we should be talking about uh, issues and not afraid of a technical discussion. All right, let me change context. Not subject, but context. We've been talking about discovery litigation. Let's go over to another part of the law viewed large. Government records. Government records. And I'd like to hear from Hugo and, and uh, uh, David and, and from Jason again. How do we get to a world in which when there's an FOIA request, the requester says, boy, lightning speed. Boy, low cost. Boy, completeness. No black blotches <laughs> on the pages. Well, certainly in the Freedom of Information Act world, making the information available uh, to requesters in a digital format, particularly when there's so much information, uh, I think is a critical first step. Now, it doesn't get around the redaction problem. Because as we learned, agencies can be very clever in the way they excise information that's stored on a disk. And we've got lots and lots of uh, examples of that. But this is an area where I think we need to use the technology to further the underlying goal of the Freedom of Information Act, which is to make government more transparent, more open, more accountable, more readily understood uh, by the general public. And if technology, whether it's in the delivery of documents or in access to information over the internet furthers that goal, then I think we're getting a little closer to the underlying purpose of the act. All right, let's throw something else into the hopper. It sort of reared its head very early, and that's privacy. It's interesting, you know, Hugo and I um, battle quite frequently both on the um, open government side and on the privacy side. Um, we would like his agency uh, to be more open about what they're doing with the uh, uh, personal data of Americans. And we'd like the agency to restrict the collection of the data on Americans. Now, he has an important mission at his agency, and the Homeland Security Office is working to safeguard the country. But I think we need to find a way um, to really make both of these things work to make the openness and accountability of a very powerful federal agency uh, really be something that we're comfortable about and at the same time begin to ask some very serious questions about the scope of data mining and profiling across the federal government. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. I mean, David knows this history, but you see in 1974, when Congress strengthened the Freedom of Information Act, said judicial review, said time limitations, it simultaneously passed the most far-reaching privacy law we have in this country, which is the Privacy Act. And you ask the question, well, how can that be? I mean, how can the Congress say open government's important and privacy's important? Were these like two different groups of people voting on two different things? But of course, it was the same group. And I think what they were saying with regard to the information explosion and the automation of data in the federal government we need to achieve both goals. We need government that is open and transparent, and we need to protect the privacy of personal information once collected. But nonetheless, I think the challenge that they were dealing with in some respects coming back to this concept of magnitude was very much on people's minds because what was happening in the federal government in the 1960s was the automation of government records. The federal government was moving from a period of entirely paper-based record-keeping systems to one in which data was now being <coughs> transferred into electronic documents and being stored, of course, in the largest agencies first. But people were beginning to think about the consequences of that. And in some respects, we're simply further down the same road today. We use terms like data mining, for example. That term wasn't used. 
uh, 40 years ago. But the idea of Big Brother databases certainly was. Ron, you've heard all this. You're a scientist. You're not a lawyer. You're a scientist. Give me blue sky. Take me out down the timeline and tell me what's going to happen. To the law, to the law, to the law, as no, best as you that's can. That's going to be tough. But let, let, me, let me make a, a few comments on some things that I've heard. First of all, um, I, I genuinely personally like the idea of transparency, and I can see how it will be very valuable in everything that we've spoken about. But let's, let's go to, say, the discovery process that we were talking about much earlier. And even in this um, utopian collaborative world where we get together and we discuss in advance how we're going to go about finding things, I'm concerned that as technology gets more and more sophisticated, and I think it's already well past the threshold, um, I could, say, let's say I'm the one who has to produce the information for my company, I could show you what algorithms, what computer programs I'm using to find the data that you want, and we can agree on a set of search terms. I'm concerned that there's no way you're going to understand that. Uh, that is, it might be transparent to a, you know, PhD who's been out of school for 15 years and understands very deep math, but to any of us normal people, it may be completely opaque, even though in a sense the process is transparent. So I have, I have a concern about the, the myth of certain types of transparency here, and um, it's certainly a, an admirable target, but it's something to, to think about because the math now is really, really nasty. Um, We're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely working how on are that. You, how are you it was all, it the Sedona has been working on that. Jason's been working on that with Trek. We also now have the eDiscovery Institute, which is a not-for-profit organization that studies and measures and figures out ways to open the black box, the proverbial black box. But if so. you open the black box and 10 million parts spill out on the table, well, it's you really still not don't know that what you've got. It's not that complicated, though, I think, because what's really behind a good search strategy is a thinking, educated person ah. who knows yeah. what they want to get. I mean, people say they can't find things, but actually you could use any one of the search technologies available today. And if you read the complaint, understand the organization, maybe even looked at the jury charges. Oh, wow, wouldn't that be interesting? And go in there knowing what you really want to find and putting together the pieces of the puzzle with an intelligent strategy about getting there. You can actually find what I call the heart of the relevant stuff, the gold. We don't have to chip at mountains of data with teaspoons. We can now go with our technology and find the gold mine. It's not going to be all the relevant stuff. It's probably going to be close to the most relevant stuff. But then when you look at that, you learn a lot of things that allow you to then do <coughs> even more educated searches. You comforted? To find the mm -hmm. veins in the arteries. And then I can explain to you how I did all that. So now you can say, oh, all right, that looks I sense right. that in part you're worried about a generational shift. Well, not, not so much that. I, it certainly sounds great to me. Um, I don't know how many people there are in the world who can actually do what Ann just suggested. You Clearly, need to plain English law with the technology. <laughs> so we can all understand it at the same level. And, well, everything she said about this sort of intelligent sort of But that's give the person. Take. That's the lawyer. Right. That's right. me thinking, or Patrick or any one of us, saying, okay, this case is about what? and who worked there, and what were the org charts, and what was the time period, and what was going on, and how do I go about getting into this data with my search tool to find what I want. And you're going to go down paths that don't bear fruit, and you're going to keep a record of that so that when your adversary says, well, why didn't you do this? You can say, well, we looked there, but this is what we found, and it didn't really work. But then when we went over here and we did this other strategy, we found these other things, and then we found another road and another road. But it's the transparency in talking about the thinking strategy that got you there with the technology. The technology doesn't work if you just hand it to the spoon diggers. You've got to have the people with, that really care about the case and know the organization working with the technology to get to the core stuff. How do you convey the sense of confidence in the technology? I show them. Right. What we Hang do. on. I, I want to I hear Ron. Well, I think that's a very good question, actually. I mean, I, again, this sounds like a great utopian scenario to me, and it sounds like some you, you've done some amount of this so far. But uh, it sounds like... Let's put it in the positive in terms of goals for the technical community. Um, as has been kind of intimated here, I know Nicholas said this before, keyword search, which is kind of the predominant way of finding things in large bases of documents, is extremely poor right now. Um, when you're on the, the Internet and you're looking for a digital camera or some prediction on who's going to take who in the NFL draft, 
You get five or ten articles in the first two pages. You don't care that there's 700,000 other things in the queue that you're not going to look at. Um, but in, in the cases that we've been talking about, um, there's a lot more sensitivity to trying to find all and only the truly relevant material. So one, one thing this raises is sort of a technology challenge, which is, is, are there ways to design search algorithms and search systems and assistant systems, if you will, to help all of you in doing this task in a lot more productive and effective way. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, to some degree, artificial intelligence as a field has envisioned in the long run that we may, in fact, have such machines. Um, my view is it's actually pretty far away, so this kind of hybrid method that you're talking about is definitely going to have to carry us for quite a long time. Any thoughts? Um, I find a certain similarity here, and only one thing I disagree with. Uh, the, uh, thing, the similarities, well, first I'll tell you two experiences. When I looked up the Yahoo case uh, in France, and the thing I found most interesting was the judge there appointed a master, what we would call a master, and the master said, you, uh, the parties agreed, well, they didn't have a choice there. But the master came in and produced a report on the science of the Yahoo and all these things. And then they said to the parties, any objections? They said, no. Now, what, that suddenly reminded me of what Lloyd Cutler had told me many years ago, that he discovered in the administrative agencies like NHTSA, if you got the experts from the different sides who weren't lawyers talking to each other, you got agreement. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So, so suddenly, I think, well, I'm, I'm sort of with you. Now, what's the similarity I see? Well, we've had three different parts, and, and uh, the uh, part on the civil side and the part on the uh, government side and the part on the privacy side. And where, where I, I see just, you know, obvious, I think of the civil side, and there I've taken away here that things are going to change away from, uh, we're going to give you orders that won't just describe what you're looking for, but they'll also will be how you look, where you look, what's the cost of looking, and you're all going to tell us how to do that. And now you say, well, to do that, um, uh, we will get cooperative. Now I think the lawyers all getting cooperative is, is uh, now you're talking utopia there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I think also, which you didn't say, but uh, 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 Judge Facciola said it. He said, you know, there is our neutral. There is a judge, and he is one. And now a horrible thing, because you told the cooperative system, you didn't say a word which we won't say, which is the inquisitorial system, because we think Torquemada. But in Europe, they don't. <laughs> They just think the judge is going to control the discovery. And although we never admit it, you've just said we're moving towards that. And we have more and more, but we better be informed there. How will we do these detailed things? How? It's the same with the privacy thing. I get these cases frequent, not all that infrequently. And I see what people want. They want what you said years ago. They want everything. <laughs> that is, they see two ideals. We want everything discoverable. Uh, 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 Marx said this very well. They want everything to be public and nothing that should uh, invade per personal privacy. Okay? We just want both. And uh, now you say, oh, really? Well, we're going to make it. Now, wait. You don't want people to get medical records. Your medical records without permission? Oh, my goodness. Ah, but you're carried unconscious into the emergency room. Maybe they should be online then because you'll be cured instead of dead. Oh, we don't want, we, we, we don't want, uh, after all, what a, what a terrible thing it would be, uh, just awful, if you could get somebody's DNA without his permission. Wait, she's dying of cancer. And if we can find her genetic makeup from her relatives, we save her life. Hmm. Well, we don't want our consumer preferences. Wait, we'll give you the iPod music that you like because we fought track. You see, we have incommensurable things and we don't know how to balance them. And that's true in all these areas. Okay, so now I have a wonderful conclusion. The only thing I disagree with, what will the judges tell us to do? If our system is working properly, we won't tell you. Because the way it works, and this is this meeting, is things bubble up, and I've seen that over and over again. That's why I say I love the American Bar Association with its 400,000 people, members, and 800,000 committees. All right, the way this <laughs> <laughs> but the way this will actually work, and it is working at this moment, is there are 40 different forums and 400 different groups where you will get together and uh, fight and argue and uh, make a lot of different recommendations. And the only thing that I hope you remember to do is call the judges in, because we do have rules committees. 
Uh, we do have, uh, and, and surprisingly, the members are not, there are some judges on it, but a lot of people who aren't. <laughs> and uh, uh, so people listen. Lloyd Cutler told me many years ago that he discovered in the administrative agencies like NHTSA, if you got the experts from the different sides who weren't lawyers talking to each other, you got agreement. Well, now you know why I miss him at faculty meetings. It's a real pleasure for us to work with H5 to host this very distinguished event with an unbelievable panel and a fantastic moderator. Uh, this is a very, very important subject. Uh, we're glad that Georgetown could contribute to the advancement of the discussion of this subject in the legal profession. Do you save all of your email? Do I save all of my emails? How do you know I even email? I use a quill and an inkstand. <laughs> I thought it was a slate. Oh, very clever, Patrick. <laughs> this kind of hybrid method that you're talking about is definitely going to have to carry us for quite a long time. In other words, Justice Breyer can complete his tenure without worrying about being replaced by a robo-judge. I know our court in a constitutional matter, what I say over and over, is we work best when others work out their problems in some way or other, and our only job is to decide whether it goes too far beyond the constitutional limits. Well, I've rarely spent two hours where I've seen that process working in a more interesting way. Of course, I grant you I started at zero level. But, but, but uh, nonetheless, I've heard all kinds of things here about uh, uh, ways of approaching these problems. And uh, so I'm going to uh, end there and say thank you very much for the opportunity to come. My thanks to this wonderful panel, and I am reliably informed that the bar is open. Thank you all for coming.